Citizens and Wildlife will now come to order. Our subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on four water related bills under committee rule 4F. Any oral statements at hearings are limited to the chairman and the ranking member. This allows us to hear from our witnesses sooner and helps members keep their schedules. Therefore, I ask unanimous consent that all other members opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they're submitted to the clerk by 5 p.m. today or the close of the hearing, whichever comes first. And hearing no objection, that is so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that Representative Raul Ruiz, Representative Juan Vargas, Representative Mark Amade, and Representative Matt Rosendale join the hearing to ask questions of the witnesses. And hearing no objection about that, it too is so ordered. Without objection, the chair may declare a recess subject to the call of the chair. As described in the notice, statements, documents, or motions must be submitted to the electronic repository. The email address for that is hnrcdocs at mail.house.gov. Additionally, please note that as with in-person meetings, members are responsible for their own microphones. Hopefully soon we'll be back to in-person proceedings and this won't be an issue, but for now, um, please do mute yourself when you're not speaking. Members can be muted by staff only to avoid inadvertent background noise. And then finally, members or witnesses experiencing technical problems, we ask you to please inform committee staff immediately. I will now recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. We're here today to consider four bills, two Democratic bills, two Republican bills focused on Western water infrastructure and drought response. But since our last drought hearing, Western drought conditions have only worsened. That's particularly true in my district and across the Klamath Basin where tribal fishing and farming communities continue to face major challenges to their livelihoods and way of life. A little over a week ago, upstream and downstream communities across the Klamath Basin came together to jointly propose a framework for drought response legislation. I want to commend the often divergent parties to those conversations for coming together around that framework. As I said recently, I'm committed to working in a problem-solving spirit on our challenges in the Klamath Basin, and Ranking Member Bentz and I are looking now at how we might be able to translate that broad framework developed by the parties into legislation that can move quickly to the president's desk. Outside of the Klamath Basin, drought conditions have also continued to worsen over the past few weeks. Over 90% of the Western United States is now in drought. Fueled by climate change, these conditions have already led to record shattering heat waves, and devastating wildfires. Earlier this month on the Colorado River, Lake Mead, our country's largest reservoir formed by Hoover Dam, hit its lowest water level on record. These unprecedented drought conditions have clearly shown that we can't keep relying on 20th century infrastructure solutions to meet 21st century challenges. Today, we'll continue a conversation about how some of our 21st century water infrastructure needs can be met in ways that better assist communities in responding to climate change and more frequent and severe drought cycles. First on the agenda, we'll hear about H.R. 4099. That's Representative Napolitano's Large Scale Water Recycling Project Investment Act. I'm really proud to be an original co-sponsor of this important bill. Large scale water recycling projects can provide significant new drought proof water supplies for Western communities. One project we'll hear about today is a regional recycling project being advanced by agencies across the Colorado River Basin. Once built, this single project can recycle and deliver enough new drought-proof water for more than a million people every year. This project and others like it can be advanced and expedited with additional federal support. Existing water recycling programs like Title 16 aren't designed to support these kind of large-scale water recycling projects. For example, Title 16 caps contributions, federal contributions at $20, 20 million dollars per project. That's less than 1% of the cost of one of the projects we'll hear about today. This kind of cap doesn't exist for similarly sized reclamation projects involving new dams, and it limits reclamation's ability to meaningfully participate in the kinds of projects that we will need to better drought-proof our water supply. I should also note that the grant program that's created 
under Representative Napolitano's bill focuses on large scale, very large scale recycling projects. Like with many other federal infrastructure programs, this is done in part to ensure that a handful of very large projects don't consume all the funding under a single program at the expense of smaller projects. So that's why a separate program and a separate funding source uh, needs to be maintained for smaller recycling projects under Title 16. Separate programs also allow each program's requirements to be tailored to the size of those projects. A $20 million recycling project shouldn't be required to go through the same evaluation process and approval process as a project that costs 100 times that amount, which is the difference in scale that we're talking about with many of these large scale projects. So I really wanna commend Representative Napolitano for her leadership on this. Um, next, we'll consider HR 3877 from Representative Ruiz. That's the Salton Sea Projects Improvement Act. The bill would increase federal authorities and funding to address the impacts of decreased water availability at the Salton Sea in Southern California, which has contributed to local air pollution and health concerns and also degraded habitat for endangered species and water birds that rely on the sea as a critical stop on the uh, Pacific Flyway. Um, during today's hearing, we'll also consider H.R. 1851 from Representative Rosendale. This is a bill that uh, we've heard about in prior Congresses. Uh, it sets up a process to establish repayment terms for project irrigators, uh, the St. Mary's Reinvestment Act. It's a bill that I have supported in the past, and I look forward to hearing from Representative Rosendale about this. One final bill, H.R. 1869 from Representative Amade. This will direct Interior to deposit certain interest payments into two trust funds established as part of the water rights settlement for the Shoshone Paiute tribes of the Duck Valley. Look forward to hearing more about this bill as well. And I will now invite Ranking Member Bentz to say a few words. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for this uh, this important hearing. And of course, I welcome members and witnesses uh, that are joining us. We are considering four bills uh, which attempt to resolve regional and local water supply related issues. And before I go into those, Mr. Chair, thank you for your mention of the climate situation. Look forward to working with you in addressing that uh, ever more uh, dire situation in that basin. So the substance of the hearing today will listen to those uh, supporting HR 1851, authored by our committee colleague, Mr. Rosendale, who seeks to rehabilitate one of the oldest Bureau of Reclamation facilities, the St. Mary's unit in Northern Montana. It, like many other federal irrigation projects out west, represents the benefit that water development can bring to a regional economy. At the same time, it also represents the enormous financial challenge of aging infrastructure uh, presented to the Bureau of Reclamation, and of course, it's tens of thousands of customers. Mr. Rosendale's bill establishes a mechanism that could potentially reduce costs to local irrigators while rehabilitating extraordinarily important part of Montana's infrastructure. I understand that the administration has concerns with this approach, but the administration needs to come to the table if it has an alternative solution that would work better. H.R. 1869 by Mr. Amade amends a 2009 Indian water rights settlement to correct an Obama administration action that ran somewhat contrary to the law. I understand this legislation will create legal and financial precedent to amend other tribal water settlements enacted around the same time and look forward to learning more about the issue. H.R. 3877, sponsored by Mr. Ruiz, significantly increases the federal government's financial involvement in the Salton Sea by something close to 2,500%. Since the federal government owns land under the diminishing sea, no one doubts there should be collaboration. There is a MOU in place for this collaboration, but this bill significantly commits more resources to what is acknowledged by everyone to be primarily a state responsibility. Nonetheless, I look forward to learning more about this issue as well. Lastly, HR 4099, uh, submitted by our committee colleague, Mrs. Napolitano, uh, establishes a new water recycling program that even this administration questions regarding the lack of a dollar cap and impact on current budget. In addition, the bill gives a blank check to the executive branch for any project that would cost less than $100 million. Um, uh, this is a interesting step, I think, in the right direction, uh, but I also look forward to learning more about the details. 
Uh, hardly anyone disagrees with the need for more water recycling, desalinization, and other innovative water supply technologies. But of course, they alone cannot solve our growing drought crisis. We need to do more than uh, the oversight hearing we had last month, and I was happy to hear uh, the chair talk about uh, the future. We, of course, should be considering west-wide legislation targeted on water storage, water recycling, desalinization, conservation, and regulatory reforms. And of course, I'm referring to the bills offered by our colleagues, Mr. Valdeo, Mr. Garcia, and the House California Republican delegation that reauthorized what's called the Bipartisan Win Act. We've asked again and again for this to happen, and there's no reason uh, one or more of these bills couldn't be on, have been on the agenda today. Uh, Mr. Chair, I commend the authors for introducing the bills. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses, and with that, I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the ranking member. We will now begin our testimony, starting with the lead sponsors of the bills on today's agenda. Under committee rules, you must limit your oral statements to five minutes, but your entire statement will appear in the hearing record when you begin speaking. Hey, the members of Congress here know this, but uh, the timer will start counting down. It will turn orange when you have one minute. And I do recommend that members and witnesses joining um, use the grid view so that they can lock the timer on their screen and keep track of the passage of time. After your testimony is complete, please remember to mute yourself to avoid any inadvertent background noise. So we're going to first hear from Representative Grace Napolitano of California. Again, she is the lead sponsor of HR 4099, the Large Scale Water Recycling Project Investment Act. Representative Napolitano, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I am so thankful to you and Mr. Uh, and the Chair's Vote Committee, Mr. Grijalva, for holding this critical hearing that is so critical to the West. I am honored to speak today on my bill, 4099, Large Scale Water Recycling Project Investment Act. <clears throat> While large scale water recycling projects are currently eligible for federal assistance through Reclamation Title 16, the most successful and primary water recycling program was not designed to support large scale recycling projects. Funding from Title 16 is capped at 20 million, like you said, uh, less than 2%, uh, costing more than 1 billion. This cap does not exist for any long other types of reclamation water supply projects, such as the dams. With several large scale water recycling projects already in the works, my bill would allow the federal government to meaningfully participate in these projects and help build the drought resilient West. The 4099 established a competitive grant program within the Department of Interior for large scale water recycling projects within the 17 Western states that have a total estimate cost of at least cap, uh, bottom line, 500 million. The bill will authorize 750 million for the program for each fiscal year 23 to 27. And federal funding would be limited to 25% of the total cost of the eligible project with no total dollar cap. That, that is to be debated because there's questions on that. Under this bill, projects that have already received funding from Title 16 would still be eligible for assistance under the new competitive grant program. The federal government has a critical role to play in working with local water managers to modernize America's water infrastructure in order to meet the needs of the growing population and the changing climate. Title 16 grant program successes have shown us how these water recycling projects not only create jobs and boost our local economies, but they can be brought online with as little as two years in cost contrast to dams, which take 10 to 15 years to build and cost upwards of 2 billion. With 90% of the West currently in drought conditions, it is critical our communities deserve more support in developing local sustainable water supplies through wide reaching water recycling projects and reuse projects. My legislation prioritizes the projects that provide multiple benefits for drought stricken states and communities reduce portable water diversions for imperiled ecosystems and advance multi-state water management plans, such as the Colorado River Drought Contingency Plan. Several large-scale water recycling projects are being planned in the West, four of them to be exact, and have the capacity to produce enough new water for tens of millions of people. For example, as we hear today, the Metropolitan Water District of California in partnership with Sanitation Districts of Los Angeles County is pursuing a multi-billion dollar regional recycled water project 
to produce 168,000 acre feet annually, more than enough water for 500 500,000 households. That's that's key. The MWD is also partnering with Southern Nevada Water Authority on a portion of the project, as we will hear from both of the witnesses. This partnership will allow MWD to reduce the reliance on the already stressed Colorado River water and transfer that uh, water over to the states, other states. As we combat extreme drought and prepare for future water shortages in the Arab West, Congress must provide additional funding opportunities now to help get large scale recycling projects off the ground. That is precisely what this critical legislation needs to do. Again, I thank uh, Chairman Grijalva and Huffman, the representative lead for the partnership and the boost cost effective large scale water recycling projects and securing a sustainable, reliable, waterproof supply for our communities. I'd like to introduce you into the record a letter I just received from the Colorado River Basin states of Arizona, California, Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming in support of, of the bill. Uh, I urge my colleagues to support my bill and, and uh, urge a yes vote on this. Thank you, and I yield back. I thank the gentlelady. Um, next, we'll hear from Representative Raul Ruiz of California. He is the sponsor of H.R. 3877, the Salton Sea Projects Improvement Act. Representative Ruiz, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for inviting me to testify on my legislation, H.R. 3877, the Salton Sea Projects Improvements Act. The Salton Sea is the most pressing public health and environmental health hazard in Southern California. The Salton Sea is California's largest lake, measuring over 300 square miles across Imperial County and Riverside County, which I represent. The Salton Sea is largely dependent on water from the Colorado River that makes its way through the Coachella Valley to the sea as agricultural runoff. Over the past decades, the shoreline of the Salton Sea has been receding, a result of water management policies in California and worsening and persistent drought in the western United States. The receding shoreline has exposed a lake bed littered with salts, chemicals, and natural occurring elements like selenium and chromium. When the high desert winds pick up this dust and bring it into the communities of the Coachella Valley, my constituents breathe this particulate matter, which can permeate the walls of their bloodstream and cause a number of chronic health issues. My constituents face some of the highest rates of asthma in California. As an emergency medicine physician, I know firsthand the effects that particulate matter has on the human body. In order to address this public health hazard, I have been calling for an all hands on deck approach to putting shovels in the ground at the Salton Sea. When I was elected, there was no plan, no money, and no projects at the Salton Sea. Now we have California's Salton Sea Management Program, a comprehensive plan to address the sea, over 300 million in state and federal funding, ongoing projects such as the Species Conservation Habitat Pro Project, but we must continue to do more. That means bringing significant federal funding to match California's efforts to construct habitat restoration and dust suppression efforts. The federal government owns 40% of the land under and around the Salton Sea. Let me repeat that, 40%. And the federal government plays a critical role in land management through agencies such as the Bureau of Reclamation. In fact, the Reclamation's fiscal year 21 budget request acknowledged that a failure to act on the exposed federally owned shoreline at the sea could result in a liability under the Clean Air Act in the hundreds of millions of dollars. But we are making progress, and I won't stop until every one of my constituents can breathe clean air and have access to clean water. Last fall, we secured the first congressional hearing on the Salton Sea in 23 years, thanks to you, Chairman. Today, we're having another and considering meaningful legislation to make a difference in the lives of Californians. During the hearing last fall, California Natural Resources Secretary Wade Crawford stated unequivocally to this committee that efforts to mitigate the decline of the Salton Sea will not be successful without a robust federal partnership. My bill that we are considering here today will help do exactly that. The Salton Sea Projects Improvement Act significantly expands the Bureau of Reclamation Reclamation's authority to participate in large-scale Salton Sea restoration and mitigation projects. Specifically, 
My legislation authorizes reclamation to carry out projects at the Salton Sea to improve air quality, fish and wild habitat, recreational opportunities, and water quality. This bill allows reclamation to build on their current work by partnering with the state, local governments, tribes, nonprofits such as Audubon, and universities. Under current law, the Bureau of Reclamation has reached their spending cap for salt and sea projects, and passage of this legislation is critical to keeping and growing the federal investment at the Salton Sea. My bill authorizes $250 million for the Salton Sea projects I just described, which will allow reclamation to make meaningful investments in the public health at the Salton Sea. The result of inaction at the Salton Sea will be severe. The Pacific Institute has measured the economic impact in action at over $70 billion in devalued property and other metrics. Rates of asthma and pulmonary conditions will increase significantly. Fish, birds, and other wildlife will continue to die, including endangered species. So I urge the committee quickly advance H.R. 3877 to Salton Sea uh, Projects Improvement Act through this committee and to the full House of Representatives to give the Bureau of Reclamation the tools they need to put shovels in the ground at the Salton Sea. Thank you for your consideration of my legislation, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Next, we will hear from Representative Amadei of Nevada. He is the sponsor of H.R. 1869, the technical correction to the Shoshone Paiute tribes of the Duck Valley Reservation Water Settlement Act of 2021. Representative Amadei, you are recognized for five minutes. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, you folks making time and Mr. Ranking Member Benson. I understand that uh, full committee chairman, Mr. Grijalva is around too, so that's great. Listen, this is kind of a, a bookkeeping thing where, um, you know, there was a settlement act done in 2009 money was escrowed in accordance with what was supposed to be done as a settlement to the folks in uh, uh, duck valley and oahe and stuff like that and everything's going according to to plan and uh, and as the money's escrowed uh interior invests the money reports directly to the tribe hey here's how your investments are going blah 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 earns a little over five million dollars and then when it comes time to wrap everything up the tribe says Hey, we'd like the interest income. And then Interior, five, six years later, whatever, says, well, you know, there was never really any authority in that to pay you the interest. Actually, there was never any authority in the act to even invest it in the first place. So, Mr. Chairman, rather than going through all that, it's one of these things where it's like, well, maybe there wasn't authority to invest it in the first place, but it was. Who was the money going for the benefit of? It was for the Duck Valley Paiute Shoshone tribe. What was it for? It was for their irrigation projects, water projects, whether they be municipal agriculture or whatever. And so then to go back five years and go, well, forget about the fact that we didn't have authority to invest it, even though we did. And forget about the fact that we earned five and a half million bucks. Forget about the fact that it was in fact your money that we agreed to in a settlement. Um, we don't have authority to pay it to you, even though we didn't have authority to invest it. And therefore, all we can do is, in a default thing is give it to the Department of Treasury, even though we've accounted to you for your investment income for all these years. So, I mean, the fix is, is pretty simple. It's like, okay, let's give everybody a pass on this thing and just say, here's your authority to pay the beneficiary of the escrow funds, the settlement funds, the interest that they earned on it, instead of a windfall to the Treasury by default. And so I don't mean to oversimplify it. And you're going to hear from uh, you're going to hear from uh, Tribal Chairman Brian Thomas here shortly, who's got an excellent statement. And it's not like, hey, we just sure like the five and a half million bucks because everybody'd love to have five and a half million bucks. Um, first of all, it's theirs. Second of all, they've got continuing projects that they want to do with that. He's detailed that for the committee, um, whether they be municipal, agricultural, or whatever. So it's one of those things where, hey, quite frankly. You know the old thing, you've been around long enough, Mr. Chairman. If Congress had intended, so the ask in, uh, in H.R. Uh, 1869 is this. I'm pretty sure they did, but let's not make it a, a horse race. Let's just pass H.R. 1689 and say, yeah, that's, that's what we really intended. Please give the folks the investment income from their settlement. And with that, uh, I think you've got uh, Chairman Thomas coming on, who's a... Uh, uh, has given you an excellent letter uh, for your record, and 
I would just uh, re request that he be shown every courtesy and that you guys look favorably upon doing the right thing by this group of folks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Nice, nice work, Mr. Amadev. We appreciate it. Um, we will next hear from Representative Rosendale of Montana. He's the sponsor of H.R. 1851, the St. Mary's Reinvestment Act. Representative Rosendale, you are recognized for five minutes, and I should let everyone know that uh, it looks like we're going to have to recess after we hear from Mr. Rosendale because votes have been called, but we will uh, be right back after that. So, Mr. Rosendale, uh, you're recognized. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And many people need a break after I'm finished speaking. It happens quite often. <laughs> also, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Chairman Grijalva and certainly Ranking Member Bentz for, and the members of the Water, Oceans, and Wildlife Subcommittee for inviting me to speak today on behalf of my bill, H.R. 1851, the St. Mary's Reinvestment Act. The Milk River Irrigation Project is critical infrastructure in north central Montana, known as the lifeline of the high line. The project reroutes water via diversion dams, canals, drops, and siphons from the St. Mary's River near Glacier National Park to supply water to residents throughout the Milk River Basin. During parts of the year, the St. Mary's supply system can provide upwards of 90% of Milk River's water flow and is critical to irrigators and water users throughout the region. While it was designed as a single purpose project for irrigation, it's critical for many towns, businesses, recreation, wildlife, and to the, the very way of life for the High Line. Today, the project supplies approximately 18,000 Montanans with municipal water and irrigates nearly 150,000 acres across the state. It's also a critical water source for the Blackfeet and Fort Belknap reservations. Authorized in 1903, the Milk River Project is one of the oldest Bureau of Reclamation projects in the nation. Initial funds were provided in 1905 and construction was completed in 1917, over 100 years ago. Already far beyond its anticipated life expectancy, the project is in desperate need of a full rehabilitation. In May of last year, one of the St. Mary's concrete drop structures north of Cutbank, Montana, suffered catastrophic failure. The collapse of Drop 5 structure jeopardized access for water users and irrigators throughout the region. Thankfully, no one was injured. And while they were able to make repairs to Drop 5 and get it back online, much of the system remains in disrepair. I personally toured the project several weeks ago and was extremely concerned by what I saw. Holes in steel siphons, steel siphons standing six feet tall with water flowing freely from those leaks, crumbling concrete structures, water access for the region, hanging on by a thread. Knowing not if the next catastrophic failure happens, but when. That's why the St. Mary's Reinvestment Act is so important and why I'm so pleased the subcommittee is holding this hearing today. The time to act is now. Highline residents cannot afford the risk that neglecting this long neglected project poses any longer. The St. Mary's Reinvestment Act requires the Secretary of the Interior acting through the Commissioner of Reclamation to conduct a study of the ability of local irrigators and water users to pay for St. Mary Canal Rehabilitation Phase 1 project. Based on this study, the bill requires the Commissioner of Reclamation to establish repayment terms for the percentage of the cost to be borne by the stakeholders. The Act also establishes that the cost share of the project shall not be less than 26.04%, a percentage that was worked out by the stakeholders. H.R. 1851 authorizes the use of appropriated funds to carry out the project and authorizes the appropriation of $52 million for the St. Mary Canal Rehabilitation Phase 1 project. And importantly, the bill provides that the project and all replacement activities are done in consultation with the Blackfeet tribe to ensure their tribal sovereignty is respected throughout this process. The bill is a result of bipartisan, bicameral negotiations and would address a critical need in the state of Montana. Water users and irrigators throughout the High Line are counting on us to support these repairs to this lifeline before it's too late. 
again, I'm grateful for the subcommittee for holding this hearing on my bill and for allowing me to participate in the hearing today. I look forward to hearing from the other witnesses and for the thoughtful consideration of this very important piece of legislation. Thank you very much, Chairman, and I yield back. I, I thank the gentleman, and um, we've got four votes pending on the floor right now, so I think it makes the most sense to go ahead and recess until we can finish that fourth vote, and we will uh, reconvene at that time. So uh, without objection, the committee will stand um, in recess.
Governor, did you uh, have a question or? River Basin State supports the bill, but they are saying a basin focused approach to funding is imperative. I want to correct it. All right. Thank you for that Thank clarification. You. And uh, with that, we will now transition to our second panel. For our second panel, we'll hear first from Mr. David Rath, Chief Engineer for the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. Then we'll hear from Chairman Brian Thomas of the Shoshone Paiute Tribes of the Duck Valley. I'll remind each witness to please remember to mute yourself after your testimony uh, so we can avoid any inadvertent background noise. And I will allow the witnesses to finish their testimony before we begin questioning. So uh, we will begin by recognizing Mr. Raff for five minutes. Welcome, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Chairman Huffman, Ranking Member Benson, members of the subcommittee. I'm David Raff, Chief Engineer for the Bureau of Reclamation within the Department of the Interior. Thank you for the opportunity to provide Interior's views on this legislation. The committee has my written statement, so I'll use my time to address a few key points. I'd like to start by saying, Chairman Huffman, that I may have seen you play volleyball in 1987. I was very into the sport in that era. Stork was probably my favorite player. I only wish my height and talent kept up with my prodigious dreams and enthusiasm. Spoken like a Pepperdine fan. With respect to HR 1851, the St. Mary unit facilities of the Milk River project are some of Reclamation's first and have been in operation for over 100 years. The project provides reliable water to over 110,000 acres of project lands with only minor repairs and improvements. This far surpasses the project design life. The failure of the St. Mary Canal drop structure last summer is a strong illustration of the need for action to repair and maintain infrastructure. It also showed what the local operating partner and Reclamation can accomplish together. Reclamation's world-class, second-to-none engineers worked with the local community, and we got the facility back into service within months. Current cost share of operation, maintenance, and repair of project facilities is consistent with the congressional authorization for the project. However, we are open to dialogue with the operating partner on finding a solution that works economically. We are as well eager to work with the bill sponsor to address concerns we have. Turning to HR 4099, adequate, Resilient and safe water supplies are fundamental to the health, economy, and security of the country. Investments in water recycling and reuse are a key step to making water systems more resilient and reliable. We can essentially create new water supplies to help address the stresses and impacts in Western communities that are and can be devastated by droughts. In recent years, there has been a shift in interest from the congressionally authorized Title 16 projects to new recycling projects authorized by Section 4009C of the Water Infrastructure Improvements for the Nation, or WIN Act. This is an indication of communities' desire for new and more flexible opportunities to address their water supply needs through water recycling. We understand there is interest from Metropolitan Water District and the Southern Nevada Water Authority in funding for large-scale recycling projects. These types of projects are a vital component of our water supply strategy, particularly as we face worsening drought and the change in climate. During my day job, I oversee Reclamation's Title 16 water recycling program. I know that the projects we fund are cutting edge and are a smart use of federal resources. I am personally interested in working with you on this program, and to that end, I and my agency would like to work with the sponsor and the committee to improve this bill's language for implementation. H.R. 3877, the Salt and Sea Project Improvement Act, is the final bill I have the opportunity to discuss. The department, through the Bureau of Reclamation, has provided more than $14 million since 2016 for dust suppression, wetland restoration, water quality improvements, environmental compliance, and land use authorizations at the Salton Sea. This act would amend the Reclamation Projects Authorization and Adjustment Act of 1992 and specifically authorize dust suppression projects. This addition will allow the federal government to proactively reduce emissions. Further, the amendments will allow the secretary to partner with many different entities to carry out projects at the Salton Sea. We have seen how partnerships like those encouraged by this bill can be successful, including where Reclamation provided $700,000, which the Audubon Society was able to leverage into $6 million in non-federal funding. These changes amongst authorization for other project types and the ceiling adjustment will increase Reclamation's flexibility and opportunity to work with partners at the Salton Sea to improve water and air quality and habitat. 
This bill would allow reclamation to continue to effectively support the California Natural Resources Agency Salt and Sea Management Program Phase 1. Finally, with respect to HR 1869, the locus of activity on those technical corrections has had only limited involvement so far by reclamation. If members have questions on that bill, I would be pleased to respond in the writing for record for the record. Thank you for the opportunity to share the views of the department on these three bills. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Raff. The chair now recognizes Chairman Brian Thomas of the Shoshone Paiute Tribes of the Duck Valley to testify. Welcome, Mr. Chairman. You're recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon, Subcommittee Chairman Huffman and Ranking Member Bentz. My name is Brian Thomas. I am the Chairman of the Shoshone Paiute Tribes of the Duck Valley Reservation. Thank you for inviting me to testify on H.R. 1869, a bill to amend the Omnibus Public Lands Management Act of 2009 to make a technical correction to the water rights settlement for the Shoshone Paiute Tribes of the Duck Valley Reservation water rights settlement. I, I would also like to thank Representative Amade for championing this legislation. In 2009, Congress enacted the Shoshone Paiute Tribes of the Duck Valley Reservation Water Rights Settlement Act. The Act Settlement Act ratified the Nevada Agreement bonifying the federal reserve water rights of the Shoshone Paiute Tribes and the separate consent decree was entered into Idaho. The, the Act further directed the United States to establish and fund two trust funds, a $45 million, develop, $45 million development fund and a $15 million maintenance fund. The Secretary of the Interior through the Office of the Special Trustee invested these funds, these trust funds from the time they were dis deposited into the tribe's accounts, regularly consulted with the tribes and providing periodic statements to the tribes concerning the investment income in the accounts. The tribes understandingly and, expect and expectation was that all investments come from these funds would accrue to the tribes in order to help the settlement to maintain its value despite inflation during the slow framework for finishing the settlement of the funds. The settlement's effective date occurred on, in January 2016 with the Secretary of Interior publishing a notice in the Federal Register stating that all the requirements for the settlement has been fulfilled despite the tribe's objections. The Department of Interior took the position that any interest earned in the tribe's account before the effective date could not be retained in the tribe's account because the Settlement Act explicitly authorized investment of the funds after the effective date, effective date of the settlement, but was silent on investment income before the effective date. The actual interest earned in the tribe's trust funds during this period was removed from the tribe's account and was remitted to Treasury rather than to the tribes because of the Department of Interior's position. HR 1869 would amend the 2009 Settlement Act to authorize the United States to appropriate the funds of interest income approximately 5 million that was earned in the tribe's trust account before the settlement effective date and deposit it back to the tribal trust funds created by the Settlement Act. This amendment is needed to fulfill the promise of the Settlement Act for the tribes, which is to be able to make use of their water rights to fulfill the economic potential of the Duck Valley Reservation. As a result of the Interior Department of the Interior position on the Settlement Act's investment of interest income, the United States Treasury and not the tribes profited from the tribal trust funds. This is not acceptable as trustee, the United States should interpret ambiguous provisions in favor of tribes. Moreover, in a practical sense, the slow time frame for appropriating money needs for this settlement and the lack of interest earnings before the effective date eroded the value of the trust fund due to inflation. This bill is consistent with the federal trust responsibility. Enacting the bill is an important step to fulfill the economic potential of the Duck Valley Reservation. Thank you for considering my testimony. I would be pleased to answer any questions that the members of the subcommittee have regarding this legislation and the underlying settlement act. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, reminding the members that committee, uh, sorry, we've already uh, pointed that out. So we're gonna bring it back to the members for questions now. And I will start by recognizing myself for five minutes 
Uh, Mr. Rapp, I'd like to begin with you. I want to ask you about the current scale of federal investment in recycling and reuse projects and um, whether we need to dramatically change the scale in response to what's going on right now. We don't need to walk through everything that's happening at Lake Powell and Lake Mead. It's really throughout the West. And um, I'd like you to speak to how expanding the federal government's involvement in what is essentially drought-proof water recycling, including these large-scale projects we're talking about, could help counter the continuing water decline levels we're seeing in Lake Powell, Lake Mead, and other places and make us more resilient and able to adapt to climate change. Thank you, Congressman Huffman. Uh, we think that uh, it's an all-in approach um, in addressing this drought and addressing uh, future climate change. Uh, water recycling is a major tool in the toolbox uh, that we think um, uh, is a, uh, an expenditure of the federal government that can support communities as well as systems uh, in addressing this drought and, and future droughts. So we're already hearing about collaboration between water managers in different states, especially in the, the Colorado Basin here. Um, could you speak to how large-scale regional recycling projects like the ones we're hearing about today uh, can help facilitate that kind of collaborative problem solving on the Colorado River? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, the Colorado is a collaborative system. Um, you know, we work with the, the basin states, we work with the tribes, we work with the uh, other entities uh, that are customers and stakeholders. And um, that type of collaborative approach of addressing and recognizing the fact that it's a system that involves states, uh, that involves regions, um, and addressing that in a manner that uh, brings to bear all of those entities together as on practical solutions is one that we're very interested in pursuing. Yeah. When, when we talk about projects that can bring these volumes of water, these are large projects. Um, it, typically, there's trade-offs. There's winners and losers, and some stakeholder groups are fighting uh, for something. Other stakeholder groups are against it. But with these recycling projects, um, we do seem to see a lot of win-win opportunities here, multiple benefits. Could you speak to how water recycling projects can uh, really provide that kind of win-win opportunity, especially for fish and wildlife? Yeah, we, we have seen a number of win-win uh, projects that have been funded through our existing authorities of Title 16, as well as other types of water recycling projects. Uh, as you mentioned exactly, that uh, some of the water um, uh, does have uh, other benefits for the environment. Uh, and also, these projects can also reduce stresses on uh, other parts of the system, um, uh, thus increasing more flexibility in the use of that water. I'd like to take you now to uh, Representative Ruiz's bill in the Salton Sea. We uh, it, it held a hearing in this subcommittee on federal and state efforts to restore the sea last year. Unfortunately, the previous administration chose not to attend or even provide uh, written testimony for that hearing. So we're glad that you're here. We're glad you're engaged on this issue. And um, I wonder if you could tell us a little more about Reclamation's current work on Salton Sea and what role uh, you see the, uh, the department playing going forward in ongoing restoration efforts. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we do see a role to play uh, since our 2016 signing of the MOU with the uh, California uh, Natural Resources Agency. Um, working with them, they are in the lead and supporting their efforts in um, uh, mitigating the impacts of, of the Salton Sea. Uh, Reclamation has invested um, approximately $14 million over the past uh, number of years uh, on uh, activities that do uh, increase uh, the uh, environmental aspects around there, the, the, the habitat, as well as dust suppression. And um, uh, we do see this bill as increasing our flexibility to do so further uh, in conjunction with the state and others. Uh, the ability of those uh, to enter into grants with NGOs and other entities uh, is a benefit of the proposed legislation. Thank you. In addition to that additional authority and flexibility, the bill would significantly boost federal funding. And I realize you've made a lot of commitments in the Salton Sea. There's been talk about uh, the MOU and other commitments. Would HR 3877 help Interior meet its commitments in the Salton Sea? Uh, well, speaking to the ceiling, the ceiling adjustment uh, should should appropriations uh, follow. Uh, the ceiling adjustment, 
it does uh, increase our ability uh, to help support the solvency management plan, the 10-year plan, um, and we're committed to working with the state um, and, and this committee in, in pursuing those uh, projects. Thanks so much, Mr. Rapp. Uh, I will now yield and recognize Ranking Member Bentz for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and sticking with Mr. Raff for a, a couple of questions. Uh, Mr. Raff, I ask previous interior witnesses uh, and have yet to get a decent answer uh, to the question about when uh, the administration is going to put together its drought relief working group. I assume the Bureau would be part of it. Do you know, has the, has the working group met yet or for that matter been formed? Uh, the, their uh, reclamation is involved in a number of activities on, on drought working groups. Uh, uh, the at the interior level, there is the interagency working group on drought. Uh, they have met uh, in the springtime. Uh, they are working with the National Drought Resiliency Partnership, uh, which involves a number of federal agencies, all, all coming to together to discuss well, what we can do both in this current drought as well as to develop policy for future droughts. And who's the leader of that group? Uh, the National Drought Resiliency Partnership. Uh, I believe the current co-chairs are Interior and the USDA. And so who so we who would we call is what I'm getting at. Who's you know if I want to pick up the phone and say what are you doing regarding drought relief on this working group? Who do I call? Uh, I think it would be best I could get you that name in the record and follow up with you uh, following this hearing. That would be excellent. And then you know, sticking with the Title 16 projects, my understanding is that your current budget, or I'm sorry, the budget for fiscal year 20 and 21 was $63 million each. And under under this proposed bill, the the numbers that are being, uh, that are included in in the, the possible increase in money, HR 4099, uh, could be in literally in the billions because the it's possible, I guess, under this bill that the American taxpayer could pay 75% of the cost. I think I've heard that the cost of the proposed plan was $4 billion or something like that. Um, do, you, do you think that, uh, that reclamation could manage that kind of uh, dramatic increase in involvement? I mean, what I'm really asking is how much more is it gonna cost for, for reclamation to play its part if you jump from such a small number to such a huge one? Uh, as I mentioned, I, I do have uh, the Title 16 activity within my portfolio here at Reclamation, and uh, we stand ready to enact uh, congressional direction. Well, uh, well, we'll probably submit some of these questions in writing because, as you mentioned earlier, they're, they're complicated and, and deserve uh, probably more detail in response. But uh, in, in 2016, the MOU between the state of California and the Inter Interior Department uh, called upon the federal government to provide 30 million for salt and sea restoration activities. Uh, uh, HR 3877 would add 250 million to that amount. Can you give us any idea if that would be enough? And by enough, I mean there's all kinds of problems with the salt and sea. It's shrinking, so I'm not quite sure how the 250 million is going to be used. So that's really my question: Is that the end of it then, of our of our federal involvement? Uh, we don't currently have a spend plan for the proposed ceiling adjustment. Uh, we will uh, prioritize and work with the partners out there uh, with uh, appropriations um, uh, from Congress. Uh, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm sorry, but I didn't turn my clock on. How much time do I have left? I see a minute 23. Well, that's excellent. <laughs> thank you. Um, so uh, let me ask one other question, and it has to do with the relative or, or comparative costs uh, between uh, the recycling, uh, water recycling project on the one hand and desalinization on the other. Uh, so, so Mr. Raff, has there been a, a comparative study uh, to, to tell us uh, which one of these approaches makes more economic sense or is it re required by virtue of the federal involvement that you do, you do a, a uh, analysis that provides that kind of an answer, which one is less expensive or which one is better suited for the purpose uh, we've been discussing. Uh, I'm. I think it would be on a case by case basis. I'm not aware of any uh, general statements that I could bring to bear that would be informative here. I can certainly uh, double check and respond in uh, in the record as well if if there is information we could provide to that. But you're right. What I'm getting at is 
the recycling cost is is uh, significant. I don't know what it costs per acre foot. That's usually the standard I use to compare these things. I know desalinization is around two thousand dollars. I'd just be curious what this water recycling cost per acre foot is. Do you have any idea uh, in, in what what it's going to cost per acre foot? Uh, I, I do not have a general statement of a, a general statement of what a cost per acre foot of water recycling would be. Uh, Mr. Chair, with that, I yield back. I thank the ranking member. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Representative Napolitano for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Rapp, uh, I have a couple of questions because your testimony references concerns regarding cost share. Can you elaborate on that for the uh, mega projects? Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Congresswoman Napolitano. Uh, so the bill um, uh, indicates that it's uh, a 25% cost share. However, it does provide that uh, projects that uh, have meet a certain set of criteria could go up to that 75% cost share. Uh, we would very much like to work with uh, you and the committee in uh, helping define uh, what that scale looks like um, and those criteria. Uh, that 75% cost share uh, is a significant uh, number and one that we want to make sure we're all on the same page with. Uh, the difference between building a dam and doing recycling is dramatic. You can get it online for less than two years. It's probably around two and a half years in some cases. And the uh, dams would take, what, a couple of decades to build and billions to construct. So that would, uh, to me, be uh, very important. Um, you agree you agree that the expanded federal support for large scale water projects can help provide relief for the communities in the Colorado River. But uh, uh, because of the predicted continued droughts, what do you think will happen if we don't agree on helping uh, the communities and the state that are partnering? Uh, uh, thank you again. Um, large scale water recycling projects, we think, is a, a tool uh, amongst others, uh, but it is certainly a significant tool. Uh, that could uh, generate increased water supplies for local communities um, and reduce stresses on, on the water system as a whole. Um, it is something that we should be exploring. And uh, again, we're very interested. I personally, as well as our department, is interested in working with you on that. Why is the Bureau of Reclamation limited under current law for meaningfully participating in big recycling projects? Address a 20 million cap under Title 16 for recycling projects. And does this blanket cap for other types of large scale water projects with similar costs like new dams. Uh, in, in congressionally authorized Title 16 projects that is authorized in the 1990s or so, um, there is a, the, the authorization limits uh, per project cost of the $20 million cap. Uh, under Title 16 as authorized by WIN 4009, um, uh, we, we implemented uh, per policy a consistent $20 million per project cap. Um, so that that is the, 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 the work that we've been doing under Title 16. Um, um, there are other types of projects that have uh, also by policy or authorization caps. Uh, but however, I'm not aware of um, caps uh, on a general authority or, or any authority uh, related to the construction of a dam. All right. Uh uh, on uh, Mr. Reese's 3877, uh, what is an example of water quality projects that the Bureau of Reclamation could help fund to address water quality under the bill? Uh, under the Salton Sea Restoration Bill, um, there are, are a, number, a variety of projects that we're looking at, uh, and we even conducted some research within our research development office on dust suppression and mitigation. Um, we think that um, uh, both uh, through the environmental projects uh, on the lands as well as uh, the dust suppression projects will increase water quality as well as um, air quality uh, in the region. But what are the consequences of the ag runoff and the chemicals that the ag runoff brings into the salt sea? Um, it, it's an all above approach. I mean, we need to be looking at runoff, which has decreased in recent years um, from agriculture into the salt sea. Um, as well as all of, all of the other uh, um, potential issues at the Salton Sea that are being realized, and we need to address all of those concerns. What the, is the state doing anything to uh, spur the project on 
uh, who do we have to talk to to be able to get California to move on and, and be a good partner with the Bureau of Reclamation? Uh, the, the state uh, has developed a 10 year plan and we're, we're, we're working with them on that. Um, uh, trying to find the, the right person in the state, that would be something that uh, I'd be happy to uh, work with you and talk to you and get that in, well, in the record as well. Mr. Raff, I've been in Congress 23 years and I'm still working on Salton Sea. Back then it was still a problem. We're still having a problem. I think we need to expedite it and move it a little faster. Mr. Chair, I yield back. I thank the gentlelady. The chair now recognizes Mr. Rosendale for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm going to dive right in. Mr. Raff, thank you for your testimony and for your statement recognizing the importance of the St. Mary's and Milk River project in serving the people of Montana. I'd like to thank the Bureau of Reclamation for moving swiftly to assess the damage following the collapse of Drop 5 structure last year and for quickly making the necessary repairs. Mr. Raff, in the Bureau's assessment, what is the risk of another catastrophic failure occurring on the project in the near, medium, and long terms without the needed rehabilitation efforts occurring? Uh, thank you, uh, Congressman Rosendale. Uh, I think that uh, Reclamation uh, recognizes that, uh, this, that this particular area of, of the St. Mary's project uh, is in need of, of repair. Uh, and we would like to be collaborative and work with uh, the Joint Border, border Control and uh, make this happen. So have you done enough of analysis to, again, uh, try to estimate when we could be facing another catastrophic failure if we don't have these repairs done, the likelihood of that? Uh, I, I do not have a timeline or an expectation of failure. Uh, we agree they need to be repaired. Um, and we also, uh, just as we did at, uh, at the drop five structure, uh, we stand with the community in, um, in, in making sure that this is a reliable source of water. Okay, thank you. Uh, listen, this risk is one of the reasons I think that this legislation is so important. It's, it's very difficult to uh, define when this failure is going to take place. It's, it, we know that it will. I appreciate you and the department working with stakeholders through the issues with previous versions of this bill. You mentioned in your testimony that you look forward to working through any remaining issues. And I certainly appreciate that commitment. Mr. Riff, what issues do still remain and how can we work together to address them to get this across the line for the irrigators and the water users up on the high line? Uh, thank, thank you, um, Congressman Rosendale. The um, uh, we're, we're interested in discussing uh, and making sure everybody understands uh, or are on the same page relative to this ability to pay study as is um, in the draft legislation um, and uh, how that would tie into potential feasibility studies and cost share um, as well as potentially different cost shares on the on the different structures there. Um, so we are very much interested in working with you on this collaborative approach um, and just want to make sure that we're, we're all on the same page. Thank you very much. And, and again, Mr. Chairman, I thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about the project today. It's critically important to the state of Montana and, and many of our residents. And uh, with that, I will yield back the remainder of my time. Thank you, Mr. Rosnail. The chair now recognizes Mr. Costa for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think this is uh, an important uh, uh, effort uh, as it relates to the four pieces of legislation we're looking at. And uh, Mr. Ralph, I want to um, uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, the Bureau's focus as it relates to uh, what is, uh, I think, uh, consistently uh, going to be the, the course of, of our challenges with climate change. and. Uh, as we say now in California, we no longer have a fire season, we have a fire year. And we, as you know, are in extreme drought conditions. I just saw temperature in Portland, Oregon was 115 degrees, which makes Fresno look balmy uh, in comparison. But um, uh, one of the things that I uh, am fond of uh, saying over the years that I've been dealing with these water issues is that we have to use all the water tools in the water toolbox. And I'm wondering uh, what 
the focus uh, of the Bureau of Reclamation with the president's efforts to invest in infrastructure. And we're looking at funding uh, to plus up as it relates to our water needs. Um, uh, all of the above approach strategy, um, certainly uh, Congresswoman Napolitano has her, uh, her efforts on recycling uh, that I've supported over the years. Um, are we doing any cost effectiveness? There was a question that was asked to you uh, earlier about the per acre foot. Uh, when we look at comparison strategies, I think we have to look at cost benefit ratio. Um, you know, whether we're talking about desalinization, whether we're talking about various conservation efforts, at the end of the day, I don't think there's one um, solution. So what what's the strategy that the Bureau's looking at here is we're looking at a new investment uh, potentially taking place. Uh, well, for each uh, potential new investment, uh, um, as congressionally authorized, uh, Reclamation does evaluate uh, in conjunction with um, statute uh, feasibility of projects. And uh, we do report back to Congress for, uh, for that direction on the feasibility of each individual project. Um, we also uh, uh, work with our stakeholders and, and regional components as we look to the future uh, through programs such as our Water Smart Basin Study Program uh, to evaluate the types of solutions that may meet water supply and demand imbalances in the future and come up with uh, different types of projects that may support uh, various types of communities uh, that may be pursued through additional study uh, and for potential implementation down the road. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I know that. I mean, I've been working on these water related issues for almost 40 years. And um, the problem is, is that we tend to put these in silos on a project by project basis. And that's fine. Uh, that's kind of the way things work around here. Uh, but the fact is, is that um, I think, uh, you know, when we're looking at competing demands for the use of water, whether we're talking about the municipal use, environmental use, or agricultural use, and we're trying to uh, look at the environmental trade-offs that uh, inevitably take place. I think there's got to be some kind of a focus, not on a project by project basis, but you know, let's just pick uh, pick a number. Let's say we're going to invest uh, uh, um, in some of the, the the funding projects I've looked at, anywhere from six to twelve billion dollars in in water, clean drinking water, and other water related projects. Uh, I just think it would behoove us to look at an evaluation, uh, not just for Western states, but uh, what, um, you know, different water tools for different uh, use works better in different areas. I mean, if you're on the coast, you can consider uh, desalinization uh, for certain applications. I mean, that's not going to work to irrigate crops, put food on America's dinner table. Um, and uh, I just think that we've got to uh, approach this um, differently if we have a chance to, um, as the president likes to say, reinvest in America's uh, infrastructure and our water is key. I mean, this is a national security issue and it doesn't get looked upon that way. Food is a national security issue. It doesn't get looked that way too often. So, um, uh, my time is about running down. I can't see the clock here. Uh, how much time do I have, Mr. Chairman? Four seconds. <laughs> <laughs> how about that? Anyway, to be continued, and there were some questions I want to ask the um, MWD person, but I may not be able to be on because I've got more things to do. But these are good pieces of legislation, and we'll continue to work together. I thank the gentleman. And the chair now recognizes uh, our newest member of the committee, Ms. Stanberry, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman Huffman and Ranking Member Benz for convening this important hearing. And thank you to uh, Madam Chairwoman Napolitano for bringing forward your important legislation, which also has significant implications for New Mexico, which is my home state. And I know you've worked with us for many years. I'm grateful for this hearing, especially as millions of Americans across the West are facing drought, which is affecting almost 90% or more of our communities across the West. 
And it's undeniable that this drought is actually a manifestation of larger scale changes that are happening as a result of climate change. In New Mexico this year, we had very little snowpack. We had virtually no monsoon season. Our soil moisture levels are among the lowest they've been in years. And just this past month, we broke an 83 record um, and Albuquerque, my hometown, reached 103 degrees, which I know for my friends in other states is not as hot as you get, but this is really significant, especially as our reservoir levels are low. And many of our farmers in New Mexico this year are facing a potential cutoff in the water allocations in the next month. And if you're a farmer, you know that can have catastrophic implications. So, you know, it is absolutely critical that we take action now to address both the short-term drought emergency that we're facing and the long-term needs of our communities. So I very much look forward to supporting and voting for um, this legislation, especially on water reuse and recycling. I think it's absolutely critical that we get more tribal water rights settlements across the finish line to protect tribal water rights and to support tribes who are seeking amendments to their water rights so that they can protect them and ensure that they have water for the future generations of um, our communities. And it's critical that we really deploy the expertise, the infrastructure capabilities and the capital of our federal government to invest in the infrastructure for our future. And in my home state, this is really about the lifeblood of our state that includes our Rio Grande and our tributaries that are not only important for farming and our communities, but are the lifeblood of our culture and our identity and who we are. So um, I really thank our folks for coming today to testify about these bills. And um, I'm actually gonna follow on some of the questions that came both from our um, ranking member as well as um, several of the other uh, uh, folks who asked questions today, which is um, directed at uh, Mr. Rath. So I know you've been put on the hot seat a little bit today about what the Bureau and um, the administration are doing about drought, but I think it's so critical that we understand, you know, what opportunities there are to work with the administration to address the catastrophic drought that so many of our communities are facing this summer. So um, with that, Mr. Rath, I know you've answered a few of these similar kinds of questions, but could you please share a little bit more about some more specifics about what the Bureau is doing to engage states and tribes and local governments this summer to deal with drought impacts? Yeah, thank you. And first, I'm, I'm honored to be in this hot seat. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to speak with you all. Um, a reclamation, um, uh, we, we have authorities within our uh, drought response program uh, where we have been uh, utilizing appropriations from that program to directly support uh, some local communities. Uh, we recognize that uh, the, the needs exceed uh, what we've been doing uh, uh, with those appropriations, and we're uh, in the process of developing a reprogramming request uh, that we will be sending to the appropriate appropriations committees uh, to hopefully uh, bring to bear a number of additional dollars and sol potential solutions uh, to support uh, all of uh, your constituents and all the constituents uh, across the Western United States. Uh, these droughts are significant and, and very impactful. Thank you, Mr. Rath. And um, I you know, just wanna say thank you also to the Bureau staff who do work in New Mexico. We're in the middle of doing a base study for the Northern Rio Grande. Um, that, that study will be critical to managing water in the future. And we look forward to working with you and are hopefully newly confirmed, soon to be newly confirmed commissioner um, to do some important work in New Mexico. And I thank you all for the opportunity to ask some questions today. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. I thank the gentlelady and the chair now recognizes Mr. Soto for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and appreciate you all being here. We know water is essential to life and that different regions face different challenges. In the Midwest, we see flooding right now. We see record heat in the West and uh, a shortage of water. And in my home state of Florida, uh, the rain seasons came a little late and we always are concerned about hurricanes. Uh, and while we get a lot of our water from the aquifer, uh, given the high growth in central Florida, 
it is key to uh, develop alternative water sources. In Orange County, where Orlando is, we're able to go not only into the upper Florida and aquifer, but also the lower Florida. Um, but that's not going to be forever uh, able to supply our water needs. In Osceola, we were able to make a change in statute to allow Taylor Creek, uh, which is currently was slated for flood control to now be utilized for water storage, uh, surface water in addition to uh, going to the Florida and aquifer. Uh, and in Polk County, we know we face uh, major water shortages. We have uh, citrus there, cattle, much like the cattle we have in Osceola County. And we have growing industry uh, in steel, in beverage manufacturing, among others. And the lack of water is limiting our growth there. Uh, so when I look at bills like Rep. Napolitano's bill uh, that would establish a grant program, uh, for competitive grants for eligible entities for large-scale water recycling and reuse projects on uh, places like Polk County and uh, Osceola and Orange County uh, would vastly benefit. Um, but it'd be great to hear from the experts on that. Uh, Mr. Raff, how do you think bills like Ms. Napolitano's bill uh, creating these competitive grants for large-scale water recycling and reuse projects would help both uh, rural areas and, and agricultural areas uh, in Central Florida. Speaking to, to Title 16 in the Western United States, uh, the investments that we've made in Title 16 uh, uh, in the Western United States have generated uh, approximately 420,000 uh, reoccurring acre feet. Uh, that's approximately amount of water uh, for uh, 420,000 families of four. Uh, so we find that to be a pretty successful uh, use um, of funds. Uh, the grant program has been successful in generating that water. Um, I can't speak specifically to Central Florida, uh, but uh, in terms of Title 16 and, and, and recycling in the West, um, it's generated uh, significant amounts of water. Turning next, uh, Mr. Raff, to the Salton Sea, it supports more than 400 species of resident migratory birds, including species listed in the Endangered Species Act. Uh, Looking at Rep. Ruiz's bill, H.R. 387, how would new authorities for habitat creation under the bill allow the federal government to better support these species? Uh, in a variety of ways, uh, we would be have a lot more flexibility to enter into uh, grants and agreements with a variety of entities under the proposed legislation. Uh, additionally, the, the raising of, of the ceiling uh, and the ability to well, work with the state and others uh, would directly lead to more on the ground projects there uh, that would uh, uh, improve water and air quality, um, as well as the dust suppression um, projects. In addition, how would additional federal funding help reclamation and other federal agencies work to improve conditions at the Salton Sea? Yeah. Uh, uh, getting projects, uh, at the Salton Sea Management Plan, the 10-year plan that's been developed uh, uh, by the state, um, identi has identified uh, approximately 30,000 acres uh, that are needed dust suppression, and uh, we are uh, eager and able uh, to start engaging with them and, and others uh, in starting to get those projects done. Thank you, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Ruiz for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman, uh, for having this hearing and including my legislation, uh, HR 3877, uh, the Salton Sea Projects Improvements Act. As I discussed in my opening testimony, the Salton Sea is the most pressing and consequential public health and environmental crisis that my constituents, and quite frankly, uh, residents in Southern California and Arizona face. The receding shoreline of the Salton Sea has exposed harmful particulate matter that is laden with chemicals, pesticides, and salt that blow into the communities where my constituents live. And I'm pleased that the Bureau of Reclama Reclamation is testifying today as a witness. Today's hearing is a big step forward to strengthening the federal partnership on the Salton Sea. The Department of Interior owns roughly 40% of the land under and around the Salton Sea, a significant portion by reclamation. In addition, reclamation manages the Colorado River, which not only 
sends water into the Salton Sea, but is the key source of drinking water for many Southern Californians. Reclamation has contributed over $14 million towards the Salton Sea project since 2016, and I have worked each year to secure this funding in the energy and water appropriations bills. While these projects have played an important role in mitigation efforts, such as restoring boat access to the North Shore Marina, they must continue to grow to make a more meaningful impact on this unfolding crisis. Simply put, federal investment at the sea must increase exponentially, and I won't stop working until that happens. I am as impatient as ever with the level of action at the Salton Sea. Look, we do not need more studies. We do not need more paperwork. What we need are shovels in the ground with real projects, and we need them in the ground yesterday. My legislation, the Salton Sea Projects Improvements Act, will help make the federal government a more significant partner in these projects and bring federal resources to build on the state of California's efforts. This bill would make a critical change to existing law to allow reclamation to participate in larger scale projects in partnership with California, the Salton Sea Authority, and other key stakeholders. Mr. Rapp, has reclamation reached their spending cap under current law for the Salton Sea Research Program? Uh, the, the authorities of uh, the 1992 Act uh, had a ceiling of 10 million that I believe we will reach, uh, are anticipated to reach a current funding in approximately 2023. So they're soon expiring, and and uh, and we won't have much available after that. So would HR 3877, which raises reclamation's authorization to 250 million dollars, allow your agency to continue to participate in projects at the Salton Sea? Uh, certainly, the, the increase from 10 million dollars to 250 million dollar ceiling uh, would provide us a, a great deal of additional flexibility in uh, providing on the ground projects, as you indicated. Um, are needed there at the Salton Sea. Great, and I've heard your answers to previous uh, members' questions that you are ready and willing and enthusiastically wanting to work on the Salton Sea. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Uh, we are uh, uh, working with the state uh, who has the lead here, and uh, we are uh, eager and, and ready to, to continue that. Great, and that is necessary. And I helped broker that MOU with the state and the federal government that also added $30 million. And because now we have a plan, uh, the Salton Sea uh, Water Management Plan that we can all uh, corral around and focus on the projects to expedite them through the, uh, the process. So Mr. Rapp, your testimony discussed strengthening partnerships and leveraging additional funding. Can you expand on how HR 3877 would allow reclamation to better protect the public's health and improve water quality? Uh, well, the proposed legislation, which uh, you obviously know uh, better than I, um, does allow for uh, grants and other types of funding mechanisms directly uh, um, that uh, weren't available in the prior legislation, uh, being able to enter into those types of agreements uh, with uh, other entities is a direct approach. Um, and uh, as well as having the direct authority for the dust suppression activities uh, would also provide that flexibility uh, to directly engage uh, in more ways um, uh, and easier um, supporting the 10-year the plan. Great, look, this is, a, this is a small investment compared to the larger scale cost of doing nothing in the tunes of tens of billions of dollars, not only in environmental da damage, but also the public's ill health if, uh, if we do nothing. So this is smart and we needed, we needed to do it yesterday. So let's get it done today and let's expedite this. And I wanna thank Chairman Huffman for your keen interest in, in this and, and the environmental justice issue around uh, this issue as well. Thank you very much for holding this hearing. The gentleman yields. I thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Vargas for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you again for holding today's hearing um, and also for holding the hearing last year on the Salton Sea. I appreciate it very much. It was an important and historic hearing for my district as we had not had a hearing on the issue in two decades. Uh, with your leadership, the great work of your staff, we were able to have one. So, again, I'm very grateful. And today I'm very grateful to be invited to participate. And I want to thank also the ranking member. Mr. Benz, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity, the, the, um, 
the courtesy of allowing me to, to testify today. I do have to say, though, I looked for you uh, last week because one of your constituents, my nephew, was in town from Klamath Falls just to say hello. And I said hello for you anyway. <laughs> but anyway, good to see you. Um, I do want to ask Mr. Rath, in your written testimony, you discussed your support for H.R. 3877 and certainly from what I've heard here today. Uh, could you describe the work you're doing on the southern end of the Salton Sea? Um, the specifics of, of project on the southern end, I, I think, would be best if I could get uh, our experts and um, uh, to respond in the record for that. Okay, well, that, that, that's fine. But how, how are you limited under current law? Because you don't have a lot of flexibility. That's my understanding. Uh, under the current authorization, uh, that we work under, we do not have the authority to conduct dust suppression activities. Um, and, and we, uh, we've been able to um, enter into agreements on research on dust suppression activities. Uh, this would provide that direct authority as well as the, the grant authorities uh, that we've discussed here uh, today. Well, I appreciate that, especially on dust suppression, as you probably know, in my district down in Imperial County, we have a very high rate of asthma, especially asthma among children. And so, but certainly the, the, the issue becomes more and more critical every day as the playa becomes more and more exposed. So we, uh, I think that this bill is absolutely imperative and I, I hope we're able to, to pass it and, and move forward. Um, so there are a number of stakeholders. I, I think uh, the, the sponsor of the bill He's done an excellent job on this bill and, and on the salt and sea in general. Um, mentioned some of the, the, the authority, you know, the local authorities, the state. And I, my understanding is that you want to work with all of these groups. I mean, you want to work with the state. You're, you're in partnership with them, and you would like to have the ability to do more. Absolutely. Um, uh, the MOU recognizes the, the state uh, in the lead here. Uh, we also recognize that we own uh, significant lands, uh, as has been mentioned. Uh, below the water and uh, it's being exposed. Um, and um, this, the partnership with the state, the partnership with others, I believe you'll be hearing uh, from the Audubon Society and I mentioned them during my oral remarks that there are successes that we can point to uh, with uh, both the state and with other entities. Um, and we all need to come to the table in this collaborative approach to, to address the issues of the Salton Sea. I appreciate that. I think that a uh, colleague from uh from Florida talked about the, the different species there are birds. It's, it really is actually incredible. When you go there and you see it, it's, it's inspiring. It's awe-inspiring. It's even frightening at one point. Um, I went on one of the plies, there were so many birds and uh, it, it, it almost reminds you of that scary movie way back in the seventies. But, uh, but again, I, I appreciate um, the work you've been doing. Um, but I, again, I wanna emphasize how important the health aspect is. Um, obviously we're in drought in the West. And again, I can't think of a more important subcommittee right now than your subcommittee dealing with these issues throughout the West. And again, to deal with the issue of, um, of, of the salt and sea in particular, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very difficult problem to be frank, but one that we've worked on for a long time and we need the flexibility. So I, uh, Mr. Chairman, I really appreciate the courtesy of allowing me to be here today. I appreciate your leadership. You've been focused on the environment for so long and uh, as they say, the, the chickens are coming home to roost. As you know, it, it, we're, in the, we're in a crisis now. We need you. And again, I appreciate the courtesy to be able to testify today. Thank you. Well, I thank the gentleman, the chickens. There was a real bird theme in, in many of your comments there, uh, Representative Vargas. And it was also your chance to plug the second congressional district because Hitchcock's movie, The Birds, was filmed in Bodega Bay. Uh, the heart of the Sonoma Coast. So uh, with that, uh, we will thank uh, Mr. Raff and Chairman Thomas for testifying, and uh, we'll now move on to the third and final panel of witnesses. Before introducing them, I will remind our non-administration uh, witnesses that they're encouraged to participate in a witness diversity survey we've created uh, with the Congressional Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Witnesses may refer to their hearing invitation material for details on that. Uh, and for the uh, next panel, after your testimony is complete, please do remember to mute yourself to avoid inadvertent background noise. We will, as always, allow all the witnesses in this panel to testify before bringing it back to the members for questions. So uh, our final panel um, begins with Mr. Devin 
uh, Upadeya, I apologize if I didn't quite get that right, but I think it's Upadeya, who is the Assistant General Manager and Chief Operating Officer of the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. Uh, next, we will hear from Mr. John Ansminger, General Manager of the Southern Nevada Water Authority. And then we will hear from Mr. Frank Ruiz, who is the Salton Sea Program Director for Audubon, California. Our final witness will be Ms. Jennifer Patrick, Project Manager for the Milk River Joint Board of Control in Montana. The chair now rep uh, recognizes Mr. Upadia, and I invite you to correct me if I got that pronunciation wrong, sir. Uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Huffman, Raking Member, member Bentz, uh, Representative Napolitano, and committee members. I want to thank you for uh, having me here today to be able to talk with you a little bit about the gains that can be made with federal assistance for large-scale water recycling projects. Uh, the district that I represent is the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. We are the largest treated drinking water provider in the United States, and we provide about half of the water that's used in Southern California for 19 million residents through six different counties. We actually provide imported water supplies coming from the Colorado River and from Northern California through the State Water Project. And the opportunity I wanna talk with you about is actually the way federal assistance can help develop a major local supply that doesn't have to be imported, but that can provide benefits to much of the Southwest. That opportunity is a regional recycled water program. It's a partnership that we have at Metropolitan with the LA County sanitation districts. Those sanitation districts operate the largest wastewater facility in Southern California. And that facility right now uh, is providing uh, treated wastewater that goes into the Pacific Ocean. And our goal is to purify that water and then move that water to some groundwater basins that are in sore need of replenishment, sustainable supplies, but ultimately to two of our treated drinking water facilities. And at that point, through potable reuse, that purified water can make it out through our regional infrastructure to much of Southern California. At full scale, this would be the largest purification facility in the United States and would provide enough water for about half a million households each year. Now, last month you heard about some of the issues uh, with drought affecting the Southwest and the Colorado River. And the fact is that the long-term solutions to the Colorado River are going to require augmentation and partnerships with the parties on the river. To that end, Southern Nevada Water Authority and Arizona have offered funding to help us with the environmental planning for this regional project with an eye towards a potential long-term exchange of Colorado River supplies when we get the full-scale project done. And this graphic that we have shows you how that would work. Essentially, we would develop this program and a new local supply in Southern California and in return for their investment in that project, we would leave behind a portion of our Colorado entitlement in Lake Mead. In future years, when Nevada or Arizona need the water, they're able to pull it from Lake Mead, thus completing that exchange. It gives you a sense of the way this project can help the Southwest, but also provide an additional tool for the federal water managers, the Bureau of Reclamation on the Colorado River in dealing with this imbalance on the river. Now, Metropolitan, we fully support uh, the Reclamation Title 16 program. This is a vital program that provides funds for communities throughout the Southwest to develop additional sustainable supplies. But that program wasn't designed to facilitate the kind of massive scale recycled water programs that I'm talking about and sharing with you. That's where the Large Scale Water Recycling Investment Act really comes in. It presents a new program that would help to fund projects that are anticipated to cost more than half a billion dollars. The cities of San Diego and Los Angeles are also pursuing equally ambitious programs to what I've described for you. And to give you a sense, the regional program I'm talking about would probably cost in the range of $4 billion, which by itself would probably double the debt load that we have at Metropolitan. Manageable, but it is a large amount of money. So as we work to drought proof our water supply and prepare for climate change, we need new federal financing tools to help advance multi-benefit programs like this one. Um, that along with 
additional funding for the Title 16 programs that already exist. So Metropolitan supports both HR 1015, the Water Recycling Investment and Improvement Act, and we also support HR 4099, the Large Scale Water Recycling Investment Act. Uh, we believe now is the time to increase federal investment in recycled water projects of all sizes. And I thank you for the opportunity to share this with you today and look forward to answering any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Upadea. The chair now recognizes Mr. Ensminger for five minutes. Welcome, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Huffman, Ranking Member Benz, uh, Representative Napolitano, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for this opportunity to testify on this bill, which is vitally important to Southern Nevada. My name is John Ensminger, and I serve as general manager of the Southern Nevada Water Authority. I have appreciated the opportunities to engage with you over the last few months on the severity of drought impacts in the Colorado River Basin. As I mentioned previously, now is the time for strong congressional leadership and significant federal investment, which is needed to reduce risk and improve resiliency to drought and changing climate conditions. I believe that you've heard us. The legislation before us today addresses several critical areas of need, and I urge its passage. As proposed, this bill will establish a long overdue essential new program to support large-scale regional recycling projects in the arid west. Southern Nevada is unique when it comes to reuse and recycling. We collect nearly every drop of Colorado River water that is used indoors, treat it, and return it to Lake Mead for return flow credits. This extends the availability of our overall resource supplies by more than 75%. Simply put, every gallon of water returned to the river today is a gallon of water that we can use tomorrow. At least locally, there is little more that we can do to expand our resource supplies through reuse. That's why we began working with the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California to explore participation in their Regional Recycled Water Advanced Purification Center, or RRWP, project. Transfers, exchanges, banking, and other types of regional collaborative water supply solutions have been successfully implemented in the lower basin over the last two decades. These have helped secure our community's long-term uh, future water resource needs. From implementing interstate banking programs to developing major new facilities like Brock Reservoir, regional multi-state partnerships have become synonymous with progress. Unlike our bank resources, which are temporary in nature, participation in the RRWP project represents a long-term supply option for our community, and we have built our financial participation into our major capital and construction plan with our board already having built uh, approved scheduled water rate increases to enable our participation. During this unprecedented drought, regional cooperation on large scale recycling and water conservation projects represents the future of the Colorado River. And this legislation exemplifies what is possible when we encourage opportunities for multi-state, multi-stakeholder win-win solutions. As Representative Napolitano has aptly noted, Federal contributions under Title 16 will not put a dent in the cost of the RRWP project. While Title 16 has supported great community projects, including, including two in Southern Nevada, the type of massive scale recycling projects required to meaningfully address today's challenges cannot be met with a $20 million cap in federal contributions. The RRWP project, for example, is anticipated to cost nearly $4 billion. Programs like this and others of similar regional scope and benefit need new financing tools to move forward. This legislation, if authorized, will provide critical resources to support large-scale multi-state and regional projects designed to enhance the sustainability of Colorado River water supplies. SNWA and Metropolitan have a long history of working together. We have a common interest in developing innovative multi-state uh, partnership solutions to our current water supply challenges. When the SNWA needed additional banking capacity, Metropolitan was a willing collaborator. Joint investments in the Brock Reservoir, the Yuma Desalting Pilot Run, water efficiency projects in the country of Mexico, and the basin-wide system conservation projects have saved hundreds of thousands of acre feet of water for the Colorado River system. And when Metropolitan weighed the potential impacts of participation in the 2019 Drought Contingency Plan, Southern Nevada offered to help by making our bank water available as a drought contribution on Metropolitan's behalf. These collaborations benefit the entire Colorado River and represent the strategic efforts required to support the development and implementation of sustainable solutions. I would also like to note that yesterday, 
the governor's representatives for the other six states that share the Colorado River uh, submitted a letter to Chairman Grijalva expressing support for the investments that I have identified in my testimony, uh, both in May and today. Nevada remains committed to supporting large scale recycling projects like the RWP and others as may be enabled by this bill. I urge your support for the passage of the proposed legislation and look forward to working uh, forward whenever uh, that opportunity occurs. I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Appreciate that, Mr. Ensminger. The chair now recognizes Mr. Ruiz. No relation to our Mr. Ruiz, I presume, uh, but welcome, sir. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chairperson Hoffman, ranking member Vance, subcommittee members, and the participants in today's hearing for this important opportunity to discuss the South Sea and the ongoing water crisis in the West. We're facing yet another year of historic drought, which is already harming communities, birds, fish, and other natural resources in California and across the West. We welcome national attention and congressional leadership to address the impacts of this ongoing drought. I also want to recognize the leadership of the Salton Sea Project Improvement Act. My name is Frank Ruiz, and I am the Salton Sea Program Director for the National Audubon Society. I am also a longtime resident of the Coachella Valley, which is located on the north side of the Salton Sea, where we witness firsthand how the Salton Sea is shrinking, the dust clouds are expanding, people around the lake is getting sicker, and the birds are disappearing. It is my intention to underscore three points today. Number one, the urgency of implementing projects on the ground. The Southern Sea is on the brink of a major ecological collapse. Salinity, le salinity levels are increasing, and toxic blue-green algae are threatening the health of people and birds, both in the water and in the air. The clock is ticking. According to the Pacific Institute, the cost of inaction could ascend up to 70 to 90 billion. The longer we wait, the more costly this becomes. In terms of dollars, in terms of people's health, and in terms of the loss of wildlife and habitat, with the ongoing dual crisis of dr drought and heat striking now throughout the West and exacerbated by the climate change, the time to act is now. Second, we need a strong participation of the federal government. While the state of California has had the responsibility of leading efforts of the Southern Sea since the 2003 QSA, federal partnership has always been a necessary part of the success. The state of California has dedicated over 360 million in public funds to build projects at the Southern Sea, but they cannot do it alone. Without the full commitment of this Congress and the Biden administration, the dust suppression and habitat mitigation projects needed at the Southern Sea will be a tall order to obtain. As the sea continues to recede and expose land dries up, the 40% of the land in and around the Southern Sea is becoming more evident. We need the federal government to be an active and leading force for success with investments and funding, expertise, and coordination between the government. And lastly, environmental justice. It is not a surprise to anyone that this region has some of the highest rates of asthma in California. It is common to hear anecdotes of young children suffering from asthma and nosebleeds. As the sea continues to recede, it will exacerbate the already existing conditions, stressing the community's health and economic, uh, economies even more. Moreover, solutions for mitigating the sea's decline can incorporate recreation opportunities such as hiking, bird watching, picnicking, and other benefits for, to the communities in this region. For these and many other reasons, the National Audubon Society supports two of the proposed bills discussed here today. Number one, HR 3877. This bill provides reclamation with additional authority to partner up with the state of California, local counties, and tribal governments, the, C the South Sea Authority, and nonprofit, nonprofit organizations on projects to address the public and environmental health crisis of the Southern Sea. This bill will expand the eligible entities able to partner with reclamation and will authorize 250 million for reclamation funding. The traditional authorized funding under the act will help reclamation accelerate projects and partnerships to address the needs of the sea. Audubon fully supports these changes that will allow reclamation to more fully participate in the restoration activities of the sea. And the second, HR 4099. Reducing consumptive water use is one of the most cost-effective actions 
that can positively affect water supply stability. Optimizing and reducing demands is critical to ensuring that limited water supplies can equitably meet the needs of people and ecosystems. Water conservation needs to, be con to con needs to continue to be aggressively pursued in conjunction with other actions, such as water reuse and recycling. New funding is needed for water use efficiency projects in urban areas, including for water recycling projects to prevent impairment to fish, wildlife, or ecosystem functions. I really appreciate the opportunity to testify this morning. Thank you very much. Mr. Ruiz, thank you. Uh, the chair now recognizes Ms. Patrick to testify for five minutes. Great, thank you. Uh, Chairman Huffman, Ranking Member Benz, members of the subcommittee, thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify on H.R. 1851, the St. Mary's Reinvestment Act. I'm here today representing the entire Milk River Basin. My name is Jennifer Patrick, and I'm the project manager for the Milk River Irrigation Joint Board of Control. The Milk River Project, referred to as the Lifeline of the High Line, was authorized March 25th, 1905, as a single-purpose irrigation project. This means irrigators are responsible for the majority of operations, maintenance, and replacement costs of the facilities. Since 1905, as many projects do, this project has added many benefits that range well beyond irrigation. The St. Mary's River provides around 60% of the water supplied for 148,000 acres of irrigated land during a normal season, but that percentage increases to over 90% during drought years like this year. Four municipalities, two rural water systems, Fort Belknap and the Blackfeet Tribal Agencies, Canada and the Bedouin National Wildlife Refuge also rely on the Milk River Project for some of their water supply needs and wildlife habitat. When we talk about miles of river, I want you to imagine the, the vast state of Montana. We start on the western edge of the Glacier National Park and we run to the eastern side of the state where it drops into the Missouri River. The enhanced river runs over 700 miles of highway miles. That's thousands of miles that jog and bend up and down and not, um, so thousands, it, it's, it's not um, counted. The stable supply of water provided for the system secures the backbone of the regional's economy. Without transferred water from the St. Mary's River Basin, irrigated agriculture and the influx of local dollars generated to the highline agriculture and communities will cease to exist. This project is situated solely within the Blackfeet Indian Reservation, and the failure of this 100-year-old system will also result in environmental damage on the Blackfeet Reservation. Failure of any component of the 29-mile system, such as a canal, a diversion, a siphon, would also be devastating to the High Line and would threaten tribal treaties with the Fort Belknap and the Blackfeet Tribe and negatively impact international relations with Canada. As one of the first reclamation projects, this project provides water to farmers and ranchers that produce food for millions of families a day, not in Montana, but across the country. The infrastructure has performed well beyond its expected design life and is in desperate need of repair. A full rehabilitation is estimated at over $200 million, of which water users would pay 74%, which is unrealistic. The loss of reliable water, which would devastate thousands of families and disrupt the food supply chain across Montana. On May 17th, this project in 2020, sorry, this project experienced a catastrophic failure of the drop structure, which further highlighted the need to address the aging infrastructure on the Milk River. Loss of the transferred water compromised the entire water system with harmful impacts to clean drinking water, irrigation, tribal compacts, wildlife habitat, and recreation for many communities that depend on it. With the help of our delegation and a positive collaboration with the state and reclamation, the Milk River Project was able to obtain funding under Public Law 11111 to re rehabilitate Drop 2 and 5. In this bill, it talks about rehabilitation of the St. Mary's Diversion Dam for the Milk River Project. This is the most urgent need because in 2020, the Alliance of the Wild Rocky filed a lawsuit against Interior regarding bull trout passage and entrainment within the St. Mary's system. A federal magistrate judge dismissed the lawsuit because of a formal consultation was, was issued and a biological opinion issued by the Fish Wildlife Services. The basis of this dismissal instructed the project to find a solution for entrainment and harassing of a threatened species and construction of a fish-friendly facility that includes rock ramps, fish screens, and ladders within the next five years adding additional layer of urgency to the replacement. The cost of the diversion dam is estimated at $60 million, of which irrigators would pay $45 million, which would almost double their current assessments. 
Montana is not sitting on the sidelines through this process either. They've invested over 20 million in band-aids and on-farm modernization to this system. In 2005, the legislature um, passed authorization for the sale of $10 million in state bonds to access these funds. We have to have a cost share, which is more agreeable than our current cost share allocation. However, we used $4 million to match the public law 11111 funds um, for the drop two and drop five failure in 2020. Additionally, in 2019, the legislature authorized uh, $40 million in low interest loans for the project and passed House Joint Resolution 7, which is a resolution illustrating the importance of St. Mary's project in the full rehabilitation unanimously. To allow for a work workable solution for all, Representative Rosendale has introduced H.R. 1851, which will allow for a cost share adjustment for the rehabilitation, rehabilitation of the St. Mary's Diversion Dam based on an ability to pay study performed by the Bureau of Reclamation and who has been a good partner, but has been handcuffed by the policies. The recent failure, lawsuits, climate change, and drought we are experiencing in the West demonstrates the vital need to address the aging infrastructure in the Milk River, beginning with the St. Mary's Diversion Dam. Chairman, ranking member, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for giving me this opportunity today, and I welcome any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Patrick. We'll now bring it back to the members for their questions, and I will begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. So, uh, Mr. Upadea, I um, want to ask you about uh, your portfolio of water supplies. Uh, we know what climate change is doing throughout the West. We know uh, we can expect more frequent and severe droughts. How important is it for you to have projects like this large scale water recycling project? You talked about the ability to serve more than 500,000 homes with what is essentially a drought proof part of your water supply portfolio. How important is that uh, as we think about more complications in the future from climate change? Well, thank you, Chair Huffman. Um, the, the point that you're making is one that's ever present in our minds as resource managers here in Southern California. It's, it's very important. And I would hearken back to uh, the late 80s, early 90s drought is something that we really learned from. It was a drought of record in California. And at that time, Southern California's water supplies were roughly 60% imported supplies and 40% local supplies. Our goal is to really flip that on its head uh, over the next 20 years. And so in the future, we should be roughly 40% uh, and 60% local, 40% import. A project like this, what we're discussing, this regional recycle water program helps us achieve those percentages. Yeah, appreciate that very much. Can you talk about how the new program that's established under uh, HR 4099 would be different uh, and whether you believe it could even be complementary to our existing uh, program Title 16 for water recycling. Thank you for the question. Uh, absolutely, we believe that it is complementary to Title 16. Um, the Title 16 program is an important program that uh, is providing support for recycled water projects for communities throughout the Southwest. But as I'd mentioned in my oral testimony, one of the challenges is as we've seen technology improve that is allowing for larger scale programs like we're discussing today, the cost structure of these programs is significantly different than um, the community scale projects that Title 16 has served over the years. So as an example, our project is a $4 billion project and it scales up in terms of the water supply that's provided but a $20 million contribution um, compared to that overall cost is pretty small. It's not a catalytic um, uh, uh, contribution. So we're, we're very supportive of both programs where Title 16 continues and, and provides its benefits, but also uh, looking at a large scale uh, funding program uh, like Representative Napolitano's uh, uh, proposal. Thank you for that. Mr. Ensminger. I'd like to ask you about the regional partnerships that we're seeing begin to form around these large scale water recycling projects. What does your agency in Southern Nevada uh, get out of participating in a partnership with Southern California on a project like this? Well, for us, it's really a continuation of what we've been doing with Metropolitan and our other partners on the river uh, for close to the last 20 years. If you look at a lot of the programs I mentioned in my testimony, uh, Lake Mead, as bad as conditions are, uh, Lake Mead is actually 50 feet higher today 
than it would otherwise be if we hadn't had these uh, regional partnerships uh, to leave more water in that reservoir. So I, I view this project as sort of that next generation of saying, yes, this will be great for the people of Southern California. Uh, it could be very, very good for the people of Southern Nevada if we can make an investment and get a small amount of water uh, back for that in, in our portfolio. But it really accrues to the benefit of the entire Colorado River Basin because when that water backs up into Lake Mead, eventually that means less water is released from Lake Powell as well. Uh, so these types of projects can help bolster uh, a river system that provides water for 40 million Americans. Mm -hmm. As we try to think big about uh, unleashing the potential for water recycling at, at the scale we're talking about here, which is bigger than anything I've seen, um, how important is it to add the federal government as a partner um, at, at a higher level beyond the, the artificial $20 million cap under Title 16? Uh, well, Representative Costa earlier referred to water as a national security issue. I mean, if you look at the seven states that share the Colorado River, uh, that represents the fifth largest economy in the world. So uh, when people talk about national scale investments and the need for our country uh, to have a healthy, sustainable water supply for the Southwest, uh, I think those numbers kind of speak for themselves. All right. Thanks very much. I will yield the balance of my time and recognize ranking member Bentz for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. An incredibly interesting conversation. And I'd like to go to Mr. Upadeya uh, uh, again. And, and really, this, this question comes uh, from, from my lack of understanding, I suppose, on what the primary justification is for uh, imposing upon the federal government a larger share of cost in this uh, proposed recycling. It wouldn't really have to be recycling. It might be desalinization. What is the justification for that increase in the, the, the federal contribution? And the reason I'm asking, of course, is I, I just want to know why there wouldn't be a stampede of folks asking for this kind of help. Uh, so your, your answer, uh, please consider it carefully. Thank you, Congressman Bentz. I understand the, the nature of the question. Um, the, the first thing that I would say is that we're talking about a regional program that is providing supply reliability um, across many, many jurisdictions. But then uh, to the point that Mr. Insminger made is providing benefits to a larger region that really includes the majority of the Southwest. Um, we're trying to structure this in a way that will help supply reliability on the Colorado River. And when we look at federal initiatives beyond just reliability, um, it's ticking the box for many of these major federal initiatives, protection against climate change, um, protection for uh, disadvantaged communities. Um, it's a little known fact that roughly half of our service area here in Metropolitan is economically disadvantaged. And this project allows water to get to those communities that are over groundwater basins that are, are not connected to the imported system. So a specific aspect of this project is that by providing replenishment for those basins, they're more sustainable and the wells that people have that are able to access those basins continue to be utilized and they're avoiding you know, additional costs to connect to more imported supplies in the future, which we don't think is sustainable. These are, these are major elements that we think are um, consistent with federal initiatives. And that's aside from the basic economic benefits that you see. The program that I described is projected to provide 50,000 jobs through the construction and ultimate operation of the program. Um, this is on a scale that's unlike other recycled water programs that we've seen provided through the Title 16 program. Right, I would just, uh, I would suggest that those elements, if those are the foundations of the ask, would apply to any number of folks throughout the West. And I just raised that issue because it seems to me uh, that it's hard to carve any particular program out uh, from what I'm, I'm going to suggest is a combination of any number of things, but the droughts, one of them, certainly a, a major one, but I would also recommend, and I'm sure you've read it, the book, uh, Science Be Damned, that talks about the uh, inappropriate, uh, shall we say, uh, thinking that went into the uh, allocation of the Colorado River. And so I'm just, I'm not gonna, I, I, I far be it for me to suggest that I wouldn't use uh, federal missteps 
made over the past century and a half as a foundation for trying to fund different uh, repair mechanisms now. Uh, but uh, so good on you for doing that, but I'm, af I'm afraid there's going to be an awfully long line. Uh, but uh, it does get us to uh, the how much, and, and this takes us kind of to the suggestion that um, uh, Congressman Rosendale has made about doing a study to see who's best able to pay. And so uh, you, I think you may have alluded to that just a bit in suggesting that many of the people within your uh, jurisdiction are uh, are uh, economically challenged. And so uh, is that, are you suggesting that maybe we should do such a, a, a study in your area also to see just how suited the, 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 the space that's going to be benefiting from this federal investment is when it comes to paying the money back? Is that the kind of uh, approach we should use in allocating these new monies? I think that, um, well, first off, thank you for the question. I do think that when you look at the economic benefits of a federal investment in projects like this, uh, for example, if you're looking at, say, a 25% contribution by the federal government to a program like what I've described, you're leveraging up that investment multiple billions of dollars and providing economic benefits to the Southwest that uh, really just represent a small percentage of what the, Fed, the federal government is providing, particularly with multipliers. An economic analysis of that, I think, uh, could be warranted and would make sense. But I also think that the larger scale benefits of looking at each of the different things that a program like this provide, including benefits to the Colorado River, uh, is warranted too. Last question is, have you guys done an analysis of the cost per acre foot of, of this recycled water program? The, the, can you, if you, if you have, I'd sure like to hear it. It doesn't have to be exact. Uh, sure. Our latest study um, is that this program will produce water at approximately $1,800 per acre foot. That's the all-in cost of both the wastewater improvements and the uh, water purification improvements required to produce the supply. Um, that compares with other recycled water projects that are out there. You mentioned seawater desalination earlier in um, uh, one of the other questions, seawater desalination is typically a few hundred dollars to even a thousand dollars more expensive than that project. Depends on the cost of the electricity, but uh, you are you are generally correct. I think it's more like a $2,100 per acre foot, but, but it depends on the electrical cost. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, I yield back. I thank the ranking member. The chair now recognizes Mr. Politano for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Devin? I'll call you Devin, would you mind? Uh, That's great, thank you. We all agree that water recycling is important to uh, all our Western states. Why is it important for Southern California and Northern California to continue to supplement the water portfolio with the mega water supply project? Uh, uh, thank you, Congresswoman Napolitano. Uh, one of the things that is important about the Southern California region is that we are a nexus between the Bay Delta and supplies that come into our area through the State Water Project and the Colorado River. And so the project that I've described would provide water supply, particularly to areas in our service area that are currently dependent on State Water Project supplies. Um, we have some groundwater basins that are heavily dependent on imported water from the State Water Project, which moves through the Bay Delta system in order to get the replenishment supply and augment stormwater locally. This project is designed to bring purified water directly to those basins so that it offsets the need to bring State Water Project supplies to those areas. That reduces the strain on the ecosystem in the Bay Delta as we're able to reduce our takes on the State Water Project supplies as a result. Well, and then you leverage that with uh, with Nevada, do you? Right. The the, um, the the structure of this deal provides benefits both to the Bay Delta and to the Colorado River, and the arrangements that uh, Mr. Insminger described are designed to be able to allow uh, Nevada and potentially Arizona to participate in the project and receive a share of our Colorado entitlement in return. Well, it, given all the, all the that we've been talking about uh, the mega projects. Do you believe that it should be separate funding streams for cycle, uh, recycle water 16 and the mega project? Uh, Congresswoman Napolitano, I, I, I do believe that they need to be separate funding uh, streams as your legislation suggests. And part of the reason for that is when you have major facilities like this, 
Um, I can understand the concern that funding for major facilities like this could drown out the ability for smaller communities to get benefits from the Title 16 program. So um, we're very supportive of continuing the Title 16 program and in fact, um, uh, continuing to fund it and increase funding for Title 16 along with a specific program that provides funding for large scale recycling programs like the one we've described today. Can you speak more to the partnership uh, with sanitation? Yeah, we have a, uh, thank you for that question. We've got a wonderful uh, partnership with LA County Sanitation District. As I had mentioned, the largest wastewater discharge in Southern California. And as a regional party, they are a major sanitation district that covers a large service area. Similarly, we're a major water district with the large service area and we're pairing our talents up uh, to partner on this project. They have a, a wonderful staff and are able to contribute on the wastewater treatment design. We're working together with them on that. We're looking at the purification side and the way we would design a system to move the water to the areas that need it. Uh, it's a wonderful partnership and we're working in lockstep on the environmental program um, to analyze the effects of this. Uh, it should be done by the end of 2023, early 2024. Well, congratulations to the Met on your wonderful partnerships. Uh, Mr. Ed Ensminger, uh, Reclamation determined that the Regional Water Recycling Project you're testifying is, is on and in, will be ineligible for Title 16 funding. Federal contribution under Title 16 are capped at 20 million per project. It doesn't put a dent, as everybody said, on uh, the billion dollar projects uh, of your project. How can federal support and the mega recycling 4099 help advance large scale reuse projects to provide benefits for your draw stricken community. Yeah, well, as as Devin has already said, I think it, it's critical to look at the number of projects like this. The, these, I believe, are going to be relatively rare. You, you only have so many opportunities throughout the United States where you have an opportunity with this much wastewater currently being discharged into the ocean uh, with local entities like Metropolitan and SNWA that can shoulder the majority of the financial burden and not ask the federal government for the entirety of that financing. Uh, so it, to me, if from a federal perspective, this is just a really great return on investment for federal uh, you know, investments. Thank you very much for your answer. There are four projects already working. So thank you very much, Mr. Chair. You'll I thank the gentlelady. The chair now recognizes Mr. Rosendale for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, greatly appreciate it. And thank you, Ms. Patrick, for being here and for your testimony today. You know, I uh, everyone has heard about the dire uh, condition of the maintenance for the St. Mary's project, but I will tell you, after I visited several weeks ago and could actually see it in person, it, it's it's frightening when you see streams of water blowing out of those large pipes from the uh, flumes that are going down through those draws and drainages. Can you share with the subcommittee the current state of some of those siphons and the drop structures at St. Mary's? Sure, absolutely. Um, so. <laughs> Number one, it's 100 years old. The, the entire system is. Um, there's been some small upgrades on it. Um, there, we had a group um, out of Oregon that's up there actually this week, and they're seeing canal losses of 60 plus CFS. Um, we're authorized for 850 cubic feet per second. And right now we're maybe getting 500, 590, 600 through the system because of the state, the, and, and then losing it in canal loss seepage and in those structures uh, back into the river. And so um, the, the system is that is benefiting from it is Canada, not anyone in the US. So it, it goes back to Canada. Okay, mm -hmm. and, and the structure when the uh, number five drop had actually uh, had collapsed. Um, just can you give folks just an idea of, of the magnitude of the size of that and, and the, the loss of structure? Yeah, the, the 100 plus feet is, is what we had to add to the current structure um, in order to rebuild it and, and put it back in because it is, um, we lost so much ground and um, everything from um, the, I guess, the failure of it. 
Um, and, and, and the structure is huge until you stand up there and you look at it and we appreciate you coming up there and seeing it. I'm sorry I couldn't be there, but it is, um, the magnitude is, is amazing. Um, you know, a two, 300 foot drop structure. Okay, and can you please share with the subcommittee the impact on the irrigators and water users if one of these siphons or concrete drops were to suffer catastrophic failure, say during the, the peak irrigation season? Sure, so it's, it's, it's 101 in Haver right now. And um, if, if we lost one of those um, diversions, we have barely enough water to make it um, probably two and a half more weeks. So we're not even into the peak growing season of our crops. Um, I'm not mentioning anything on the um, pallid sturgeon, the bull trout, the ESA components, uh, the wildlife, everything that, that dries up along with the municipalities. We have four or five mis municipalities on the project, plus um, all of the aquifers, like last year's failure, we saw 10 miles out, they, they dried up. So um, it's, it would be a detrimental effect to us. So as uh, Representative uh, Bentz was referring to earlier on some of the other projects, uh, being able to actually measure the financial impact that they have on it. Um, would it be fair to say that, that, that truly this project, you have a quantifiable or measurable increase in the tax revenue generated as a direct result of the preservation of this project because of the dramatic increase in the crop production and the commerce that's produced in the communities which are directly reliant on this water for their existence? Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, the, the tax bases alone in the county taxes going from dry land to irrigated, um, the, the difference in your commodities of crops and hay and grains and everything like that, an irrigated ton versus a non-irrigated ton, it, it would be very, um, I mean, you essentially go back to dry land farming and the soils are not sustainable in this area for dry land farming. Thank you so much, Jen. I appreciate it. I appreciate your work as manager of the project and for your advocacy for the much needed long overdue rehabilitation of the St. Mary's and Milk River project. And Mr. Chair, I would yield back the balance of my time. Thank you so much. I thank the gentleman very much. And last but certainly not least, we'll hear from Dr. and Congressman Raul Ruiz to close us out. You're recognized for five minutes, Doctor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Pastor Ruiz, it's great to see you here, and I'd like to thank you for your hard work and dedication to the Salton Sea. Frank Ruiz is not only a constituent of mine, but a close personal friend, and I attended his church, and I'm honored that he is appearing before the committee today. Audubon is a critical non-governmental partner at the Salton Sea, and their mission to restore habitat will be essential to the long-term ability to protect the public's health. Most recently, Audubon has received grant funding from the Bureau of Reclamation to fund a wetland restoration project at Bombay Beach at the Salton Sea. Uh, Mr. Ruiz, can you please briefly describe the Bombay Beach wetlands project? Then where every drop of water is so valuable and scarce, uh, Audubon intends to demonstrate through this project the most effective way of utilizing water with multiple benefits. This project aims to protect, enhance, and expand the existing wetlands, develop more vegetation on recently exposed playa to, to help control dust erosion and protect the health of the community, provide community access, and potentially provide recreation opportunities for the community members, such as bird watching, hiking, picnicking, research and education opportunities for the young folks. And, and how much federal funding did Audubon receive for this project and what is that funding for? We got just over 700,000 from BOR and this funding is to put the, uh, the, the preliminary pre-design concept uh, of, the bay, of, the, uh, of the wetlands that will, that will expand. Uh, the, the intention is to expand them, to protect it, and to continue providing more uh, habitat for the birds and protect the communities. Thank you. Thank you. My legislation, the Salton Sea Projects Improvement Act, 
would authorize reclamation to carry out projects at the Salton Sea to improve air quality, fish and wildlife habitat, recreational opportunities, and water quality. This bill allows reclamation to conduct this work by partnering with the state, local governments, tribes, nonprofits, and universities. Mr. Ruiz, how would Audubon be able to expand on their work with reclamation under this legislation? It will allow reclamation to uh, take a more of a comprehensive approach. And this is the intention of Audubon. Audubon would like to work with so many different partners and so many different agencies. And we need to take, uh, we have to remember that the approach that we need to take at the Salton Sea is a comprehensive approach. We can no longer afford to take a piecemeal approach. Uh, if reclamation is empowered uh, with authority, with the funding, it will allow us to look at it from a comprehensive way and uh, expedite the process to implement the projects on the ground. Thank you. During a hearing before this committee last fall, California's Natural Resources Secretary Wade Foote stated, quote, without federal funding, we're not actually going to be able to materialize these projects in the time frame that we need, unquote. Bringing additional federal resources to the Salton Sea is paramount to protecting the public's health and restoring a healthy ecosystem. Mr. Ruiz, can you please describe to this committee the consequences of inaction at the Salton Sea? As I mentioned in my testimony, the cost of inaction, according to the Pacific Institute, can ascend up to 70 to 90 billion. And I think, you know, we've been conservative, you know, with those numbers. Uh, if we do not address this issue right now, it can potentially affect more than 650,000 people in Southern California. But if we even add the people that live across the border with, you know, from Mexico, it will probably add to 1.5 million people. Uh, the, cost of inaction, the cost of inaction will be huge. So I think it's the time to act now and to bring the funding, to bring the deep coordination and collaboration from regional, state, and federal government is a must. Thank you. As we discussed, the Salton Sea Projects Improvement Act is needed, necessary, and critical to bring federal resources to the Salton Sea. And I will continue to push for the all hands on deck approach to bring federal, state, tribal, local agencies together to put shovels in the ground to construct habitat restoration and, and dust suppression projects that will protect our region. Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this hearing today. And once again, I urge your committee to move this legislation forward to the House for a vote as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Frank Ruiz, for participating. You've been a champion and a leading voice locally and regionally uh, to help protect the, the health and the environment uh, of our communities. And I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I want to also thank all the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. The members of this committee may have some additional questions for the witnesses, and we will ask you to respond to those in writing. Under committee rule 3.0, members of the committee must submit written questions within three business days following the hearing, and then our record will be kept open for another 10 business days to allow for responses. If there's no further business for the committee, seeing none without objection, the committee stands adjourned.